Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the fourth Sunday of these great 50 days. And so the essence of the teachings today in this passage is that God is light. And he enlightens our minds and our hearts and our souls. And he does this to dispel the darkness that lives in sin in our lives. But in order to receive this divine light, we have to hear the word of God. We have to repent of our sins and we have to follow his commands. The, the theme of light versus darkness. This is very common in, in the movies and in TV. A lot of movies uh, take the theme of good versus evil. And they portray this as a battle between light versus darkness. I know you guys are imagining different TV shows that do this or movies that do this. But this is also very common in scripture. Um, for example, when we look to the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. Matthew quotes from Isaiah the prophet uh, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. He says, The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. What does it mean that people who sat in darkness and the region of shadow of death? Well, without God, the world is full of darkness. And there's many different types of forms of darkness that overwhelms the people. And the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ changes this world and changes this darkness and brought light and life. Today, I want to I highlight several aspects of darkness that threatens all of us. No one's uh, immune to this threat. And we see how God's divine light dispels every type of darkness. Our Christian faith teaches that God is light, and he brings his divine light into a dark world of sin and death. And for those who choose to live in that light, who choose to be filled with that divine light, St. Paul says this about you. He says, For you were once in darkness, but now you are the light in the world. Walk as children of light. Have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. This is in Ephesians chapter 5. So you, you are and I am light. We are children of light. We are called to walk each and every day in that light. Again, light versus darkness. The divine light has come into the world through the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God's light shines in the darkness of the world. And he chases away all shadows of darkness. So let's look at several areas of darkness that God dispels in our lives. If we choose to walk with him, he dispels the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of sin and hatred and pride and violence and death. First, let's take a look at the darkness of ignorance. We know that all types of education and knowledge open up our minds and give us a new understanding to the world and the reality that's around us. This is good. This is a good thing. But the greatest ignorance that someone can experience is that of not knowing the one who created us. Not knowing God. And unfortunately, too many people today in our society are growing up with a secular worldview, a secular perspective that pushes God out of the way. They don't know, or maybe they don't want to know who created us, why he created us, or any of that. And so the darkness of atheism, it is truly a darkness, of the darkness of simply or denying not knowing about God, not knowing God, is a terrible ignorance. It's a worldview where we choose to live without connecting to the source of true life, of true love and light. And that's the beauty of the incarnation, the feast of God becoming one of us and revealing himself to the world. In the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can know our Creator. In Christ, we see God as a human being and learn about the potential, the true potential of what it means to be a human being, what we can strive for, to be perfect in Christ. So, I pray that may each of us strive to grow more in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to read the scripture on a daily, regular basis, 
We say this almost in every sermon because we know that we, ha- we need a reminder because it's so easy to take the wide path. So we need to truly know our scripture. We need to learn about our Orthodox faith more deeply and richly. And we have to discover who God truly is, not what we think he is, not what we hear about him, but we have to understand him more intimately. And so this divine knowledge will lead us out of the darkness of ignorance. But ignorance of God can lead to another darkness. The great Russian writer Dostoevsky, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, but I think you guys know what I'm talking about. He said, and he put it, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. If there is no God, then there is no rules to live by. No moral law we must follow. We can do whatever we want. And this is a very popular worldview. We see it very clearly the second we turn on TV. We can do whatever we want. And so the darkness of ignorance of God leads us to the darkness of sin and evil. If we don't know God, or if we choose not to know God, then we don't understand what he expects from us, what he commands us. When we push God out of our lives, we mute our conscience. We begin to create our own standard of living, our own standard of right and wrong, of good and evil, that it eventually creates a standard that justifies whatever we want. Our lives become egocentric. Once C.S. Lewis He was an atheist, and he he talked about not wanting any great interfere in his life. As long as he didn't believe in God, as long as he didn't know anything about God, then he could do whatever he wanted. And so it is with many, many people today. It leads to a darkness of sin and evil. We create our own system of right and wrong. This is an egocentric darkness, and it can lead to the darkness of hatred. We hate others because we don't understand them to be people that are created in the image and likeness of God. When someone does something that hurts us, we hold on to bitterness and resentment towards them, and this darkens our souls. And it blinds us to the virtues of mercy and forgiveness and grace. Hatred leads to a a self-righteous bitterness and resentment. And God's light, he radically changes this dark perspective. We learn the teachings of Christ. What does he say about this? He says, love your enemies. He says, turn the other cheek. He says, do good to those who mistreat you. Forgive seven times 70. Become perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And so these radical teachings of Christ chase away the darkness of the egocentric hatred and takes it away. Of course, it's hard to forgive when someone has seriously hurt you. It's hard to love someone who mistreats us or even hates us. It's hard to turn the other cheek when someone isn't repentant. But God never tells us to do these things alone. He says it's not by yourself that you can do these things. What's impossible for man is possible for God. Our Lord promises to shine his light into our darkened souls and his light will show us the way to love and to forgive and how to treat others, even our enemies, with kindness and with goodness. The light of God enlightens our path and leads us to the heavenly kingdom that is here and now. Ultimately, the greatest darkness that we face in the world is the final darkness of death. And the mystery of death doesn't pass anybody. Death can come at any age, and for many we fear this final darkness that's full of mystery. For someone who doesn't believe in God, then the death is the end of everything. That's it. And actually it's a horrible ending. But for those who know Christ, then we understand the verse that says, Light has dawned in the regions of death. We no longer are afraid of death because we know it's not the end. Christ has conquered death. He has opened the gates of eternal life. His divine light has shone forth into the darkest regions of the earth. And 
burst forth new life. So even this most, this most fearful event, this ending of our earthly life becomes a new beginning in eternal life. Light versus darkness. We have to choose. We have a choice. Do we want to live under the light of Christ? Do we want to allow his light to transform our entire perspective on living? Or will we choose to ignore his light? And it's subtle. It's skipping prayer. It's skipping scripture. It's, you know, not really making church the priority. I'll come next week, if there is a next week. It's subtle. We cannot allow the darkness of this world to engulf us and to lead us into despair. I pray that each one of us chooses the right path to walk in the divine light of God each and every moment of their days. St. Paul gives us some more of instruction. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, Brethren, walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead, instead expose them. It's beautiful instruction. Because how do we apply this? What it is to be a children of light is to be someone who bears the fruit of light. This light is the divine light that comes by the grace of the Holy Spirit. It guides us. It shows us that when we show fruits that are good and right and true, that we are actually showing divine fruit. Because ultimately, the source of anything that is good comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, without me, you can do nothing. So St. Paul continues to say, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. It should go without saying that when we commit sin, we are not being productive. We're not being fruitful. We are wasting valuable time that has been given to us. We're wasting the life that has been blessed by God when we sin. We have especially wasted the baptism that we've received through the, Christ, through the church. All of it is wasted on one who partakes of the works of darkness in an unrepentant way. That's the, I'm going to underline that point. In an unrepentant way. We all make mistakes. But it starts from cutting off God, but sin does not rest until it's cut us off from our families, our friends, out of our minds. Sin is relentless. Don't take it casually. Sin literally makes us useless to God and useless to our fellow brothers and sisters. This is the reason why St. Paul says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. Of all things, Christ shall give you light. Awake. This is why St. Paul, again, I'm going to highlight this point. He says, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. There are many ways that we can expose our sins, but I'm going to focus on the most important one. The one that the church provides free of charge to his people. The sacrament of confession. We've mentioned in the past that there is a significant difference of the spiritual life of those who confess regularly and those who confess sporadically or never confess at all. Or they think it's only for the youth. Because I don't want them to get into trouble. So we think I need the youth to talk to Obuna so Obuna can fix it. And then as adults, we kind of take our time when it comes to confession. I've mentioned confession is a powerful medicine given to us directly from the mouth of our Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel, in the fraction that we pray during these holy 50. It's no wonder that the church emphasizes these words. Receive the Holy Spirit to those whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. And those whose sins you retain, they are retained. Out of all the scripture to quote in the, in the fraction of the Holy 50 Days, the church emphasizes this point. Confession is your opportunity to expose your works of darkness to the light. And it's not the light of the priest. No, it's the light of Christ that works dynamically in the one who comes to him boldly and lays their sins at the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the beauty of confession. This is 
The sacrifice of the ego and pride is exactly what the Lord is seeking after. That's why King David in the Psalms say, A sacrifice that is pleasing to God is a broken spirit, a humble and contrite heart you will not despise. Don't simply tell God in private that your sin is broken, that your spirit is broken. Don't tell God in private that you are sorry for your sins. This is good. This is the first step. But prove to your heart that it needs to be humbled by opening up and saying the words out loud and being accountable in front of the priest. Bringing your sins to the place where they can be exposed more fully. Bring them to the place where they can be completely removed by the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. The priest is not interested in your sins. I know that might be a shocker. The priest doesn't care about the sins. Just like the doctor doesn't care about your sickness. All he cares about is your recovery. That's what the doctor cares about. Same with the priest. He wants to see you healthy and holy. That's the beauty of the sacrament of confession. So how often should we confess? That's between you and your father confession. But regularly. It should be more than once a year. I'm going to put that as kind of a, a frame of, of reference. You can and you should confess more often if you have something serious that's going on in your life that needs to be confessed outside the regular routine. You should also confess when you feel that you are weighed down emotionally, struggling to pray, struggling to progress in your spiritual life. It's a good red flag. Something needs to change. Come and be healed and start on the road of wellness by receiving what the church offers for free. Come and expose the darkness of your heart to the light of Christ. Let us awake where there will still be time, as St. Paul writes, Christ shall give you light. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. I'm concluding my thoughts. We are all called to be light because we have received the Holy Spirit, who is light. Oftentimes, though, we keep this light hidden. We keep this light bottled up. Maybe we're waiting for the right time to expose the light, to unbottle it. Maybe we're afraid and we're a little bit insecure that if people see this light, they're going to find it strange. They're going to look at us differently. Even within our own Christian community, our own Coptic community, it's very difficult to show the light, to fast with your fellow people after a service at church and people look at your plate to see what you're eating. And if you're fasting, truly fasting, they give you that you're holier than thou. It's hard. It's very difficult. Why do we do this to each other? That's a different topic. Sorry. But something amazing happens when we're bold to show that light. It's like a person that has an effect of, of a moth being drawn to a flame. Everybody wants what that person has. Think of that person who, who shows that Christ-like life, who shows the light of Christ in your life, that servant, that person, that family member, that is just the light of Christ. You want what they have. You're drawn to them. Everybody wants what that person has. Maybe it's the strength of their character. Maybe it's their integrity. But something about them is different. And you see Christ in them. And that's because those who are living an active faith in Christ have peace and joy and warmth. They're not saying anything. They're not quoting scripture. They're not, they're not preaching the church fathers every second that they can. There's just something different about them. St. John Chrysostom says it beautifully. Preach always and when necessary speak. Preach always and when necessary speak. Sure, everybody has struggles. Everybody has disappointments and failures. And sure, they sin. We all do. And sometimes they look very human all of a sudden. But it also looks like they're, they're growing into the children of God. They're walking as children of light. 
And in a day and age when those things are at a minimum around in the world around us, and the world doesn't even realize how much is needed to unbottle that light. Our God pours out his love in the person of his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he tells us to be thankful about what we've been given and to use it to guide others who have never really known the truth. They've never really seen the light. They've never seen goodness. There are so many out there that have never encountered true love. What separates a, a Christian from everyone else is not a rigid um, system of morals or discipline. People get that wrong when they think of the Orthodox Church. I want you to know that if you see an Orthodox faithful that is treating life like a funeral, be, be careful. Be aware. That's not okay. God has not called us to be part of a funeral, but to have joy that is fit for a wedding, an appropriate wedding, an appropriate celebration of a wedding. You know what, I'm, you know what I mean? Because Christ has united the heavens and the earth because the church is the bride of Christ. Where there's legalism at work, you see a funeral type of atmosphere. But we are bound by the spirit, not the letter of the law. We have some of those formal disciplines, those aspects in the Orthodox Church, absolutely. But what separates us is our unfailing love for each other and every person that we encounter. That's what makes it different. Whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, it's the love. Our Lord reminds us, they will know you, that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not by the, the, the legalism of what we try to display. We are going to know, if, if he's going to know that if we're disciples of him, if we have love for one another. In our time, when so many people are blind to God, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us to be light and to show people a way out of the maze of darkness into the arms of the Heavenly Father. And we can only do this by loving others as Christ loves us and by teaching others about the source of our love. That is the kind of light that you see on the mountaintop. That's a transfigured light. That's a light that you can't ignore it if you, can, if you even want to try it. May God give us this light and help us to share it with all, and glory be to God forever. Amen.